Shalom everyone. Wednesday afternoon, December 13th, in the middle of our Hanukkah is day six. So now tonight we'll start day seven. We're going to just take a little side tour through Hanukkah. I doubt we'll have time at the end of class to come back into Bereshit, into Genesis. If we do not, we will pick that up in the new year. Can you believe that? 2024, we'll get back on. We're about two thirds of the way through Genesis, so don't get discouraged. We're gonna make it. <laughs> but today we're going to talk about Hanukkah. And I think it's relevant today because of what's going on in Israel, the battle for her very survival. And uh, my, many comments are being made about the soldiers being in the spirit of the Maccabees, that they're our heroes of today. Having said that, we all know that the attack that happened on October 7th, I'm not here to get back to that detail, but one of the first um, little, it's just, it's a Moshav, it's a little community right inside, just, just the Gaza borders right there in their backyard, okay, so they're the first community there. They weren't hit as hard as the kibbutzim that were hit down there, but on their very street, Hamas came in, and or streets, because there's more than one, but was in the homes. We have the miracle story of one adult young woman who hid under her staircase for three hours while Hamas was in her house, and they never saw her. That's nothing but a miracle. This, that happened, and what we're going to see is in the, the community called Sederot. Sederot is familiar to those of you who know Tom and Jeannie. They've stayed in homes in Sederot. We, they have close friends in this community. It's a soldier from Sederot that is uh, uh, lighting a menorah. I won't say any more. I'll let the video say it. But it, it, it just touched my heart because this is the Israeli resilience. Is that the, the one that the little kids made? No. <clears throat> No, um, I haven't seen that one, so I'll have to see that one sometime. I don't know what's in the bag. You can move it. It's not mine. <laughs> okay, so Roger, can you call up that? Um, it is, I think, in, off right of up. YouTube if people go looking later, or you can ask me for the link. But taking you just real quick to a uh, celebration in Cedar Road. I'll take just a second as he splits and shares the screen. I threw it at him at the last minute. That's oh. not, you know, nice to do, but bless his heart. There we go. We're standing here in front of the Chabad Center in Sterot, in southern Israel, to light the first candle for Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights. But this isn't your average Hanukkah. This one is made out of rockets that were launched by Hamas terrorists at Israeli civilians. The idea was to transform something dark and Oh, oh. Okay, let us start. Center in yeah. Sterot, in southern Israel, to light the first candle for Hanukkah, the festival of lights. This isn't your average Hanukkah. This one is made out of rockets that were launched by Hamas terrorists at Israeli civilians. The idea was to transform something dark and evil into a way to spread the light. What better way to do that than to use weapons that were used to attack us and turn them into a tool to remind us that the darkest nights are when you see the lights the most. Hanukkah represents resilience and defending our values in the face of those who wish to exterminate us. We have never stood taller or stronger, and we will continue to do so while proudly defending life and standing to our values. We wish all around the world to continue striving for life. Happy Hanukkah from the IDF. And there's your rocket the mortar shells. We're standing here yeah, you in front have of the Kabbalah Center it, it's in Sedevot in southern Israel. That's it. Like That's it. That's it. I told you it was real That's short. But this isn't your average Hanukkah. This one is made out. Wow. That's pretty cool. Wow. Is that not? If you didn't catch and understand, actual rockets that were launched at Israel to kill them, they, you know, the shells are there. They picked those shells up made a Hanukkah out of it, <laughs> and they're lighting one each night in, in honor of the resilience, yeah. the, the miraculous um, protection and the resilience to turn something evil into something that brings the light. That's and when awesome. we go into the light of Hanukkah today, I think mm -hmm. that'll have even more meaning, but is that not? Yes, I just, that just really touched my heart, because that, that's the spirit, and that's uh, what God's put in the heart of the Jew to survive, really, mm -hmm. so.
on on their website on well on uh, I think it's one of their websites anyway. You can rockusterroses.com. You can actually purchase menorahs, small menorahs that were rockus for little menorahs, um, just like that one, but miniature size. They also have necklaces that it says "I stand with Israel" or "Israel is forever." Yeah. And that's just a new one that they just recently did. Yeah, and if you bring them home, ID tags also for the message. There's just yeah. a lot going on. But uh, that's the spirit of yeah. Hanukkah. That's the, the spirit that I'll be talking with you about. So if you all want to stay where you're at, you can. If you want to go back to, well, go back and eat. <laughs> oh, I need to be mic'd. Thank you. I need to be mic'd. Do you have the mic? Oh, yep, that was. Yes, she's telling me. I thought she wanted to go eat. She's <laughs> telling me, get on the mic. Face so cover. Or... <laughs> okay. Um, I'll get my notes in order, and we'll go back. We'll talk about history first, and then we'll talk about our days. And there we go. That's what I wanted. Okay, so if you can come real quick. Sorry, folks. We think we're all together, and I don't realize, but yes. So is our missionaries all right over there? Uh, Tom and Jeannie are home now. They're looking to go back. As soon as God provides the finances to go back, they'll go back. Mm -hmm. uh, they're being asked already to come back because they're such an encouragement to the people. Oh. Um, but uh, they, they were kept safe the entire time. Okay. Am I on already? Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I can hear it now. Um, so thank the Lord. Yes, Tom and Jeannie came home safely, but they their hearts are there, and they want to return and go and do what they can to help. Um, Orn, that has his soldiers down in Gaza, has been telling them, he had, Tom, if you come back, we can you can help with this, you can help with that. That's all Tom needs to hear. Lights the fire to him. He's ready to go. Um, we got a good report from them, all that the Lord did through them, well, <coughs> that they know of. <laughs> Um, was it was it Tom that showed us, or was it in the news where uh, the kids were making the menorahs out of whatever clay or whatever, so that and painted them and sent them to the soldiers that are fighting, so they can light them on the field? That's in the news. I haven't seen that. That's beautiful. Oh. That's beautiful. Yeah, and does not surprise me that they're they're doing that. That's great. So, yeah, there's a lot of news out there. It's very depressing and very hard. But there are wonderful stories that are coming out too. So I encourage you, weed through it and find what will encourage your, your spirit and uh, be blessed. Um, Hanukkah is an important part of our Jewish history. And uh, I, I just, you're in a very old tradition because it initiates or it, its beginning initiation is all the way back in 165 to 164 BC. So we're looking at over 2,200 years. That's a long time for a tradition. And it has been celebrated every year since then. I think the only older one that we probably have is Pesach, Passover. That goes back to 1445 BC, continually kept. The Hanukkah comes between the Testaments. It's called the Intertestamental Period. So it's after the last book of the original covenant, what you call the Old Testament, was written, and it's before the first books of the New Covenant, the Brich Hadashah, were written. So we don't find it as a commandment. We don't find it as one of the seven holy festivals or feasts or days that were to be kept unto the Lord that are recorded for us in Viagra and Leviticus and Shemot, Exodus, and other places. But we do know that Yeshua Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, so I think that gives it a stamp of approval. But before I get to his celebrating it, because it already was almost 200 years old when he was celebrating it, let me go back and give you a little bit of our history. I'm going to go back to um, Alexander the Great, and I'm going to tell you that he, in the 300 BC, he came into power, and he wanted to Hellenize the world. He wanted to bring Greek culture and Greek influence to the entire world. So Greek influence had infiltrated into Israel. There were those who were called the Hellenists. They were Greek-speaking Jews, and there were those who liked what was brought. He brought the greatest library. It's the time when the Bible, with um, the scriptures that were, which is the original, 
were written from um, Hebrew into the Greek. It's called the Septuagint. You hear people that say they, they use the Septuagint to this day. So there was a lot of good that he did bring, a lot of culture and so forth. And there were those um, Jews that, that embraced it. And then there were traditionalists who fought it, that they wanted pure Orthodox um, Jewishness, I'll say, or maybe I can say Judaism at this point. But Alexander um, the Great dies and his empire is split up among four generals. I think you're all pretty familiar with that in history. And Tigus Epiphanes at the time we're going to talk about was in control in Syria. And he wanted to um, control Egypt. What's between Syria and Egypt is nothing but the land of Israel. So he's going to um, deal with Israel because of where she is in that way. He wanted control everywhere. Um, Rome's rising at this time. Is Rome that's going to give him trouble and some of the, the Greek empire that's still there that's not going to allow um, Antiochus Epiphanes to swallow up countries, which is his desire. We can see the relation here. It would be like with Russia trying to swallow up Ukraine and someone else, let's say the United States, stopping her and saying, no, you're not allowed to do that. Well, he was down in Egypt. I'm trying to shorten a lot of history and just bring it to you in shorter form. He was uh, down in Egypt when he was trying to take control. And as Rome was rising, one that was coming up in leadership there took him on personally and told him he either backs down and goes back home or he's in trouble with all of Rome and the power that was coming up. And he, of course, had to acquiesce. But it wasn't out of a desire to, it was being forced to. So he went on a rampage on his way back home and made even more control in Israel uh, according to his ways. Um, he, he already had a lot of control in Israel, but at this point he went um, to, to the greater degree, brought in the foreign military, uh, he renamed uh, places, uh, I'm trying to think, when I, the Acre became Antioch, um, we know later Yerushalayim gets a different name, but that was by Rome, but he, he was just infiltrating in every way he could. He was stopping Orthodox worship of God. You could not worship the, the one true and living God of Israel as they wanted to be free to do to follow the scriptures. If they were caught studying Torah, so the Torah scrolls, it was immediate death just because they had a scroll. All the scrolls were taken away, burned, or um, if they were caught with them, then it was immediate death penalty. Now, some of our religious people hid scrolls in caves in the Judean hills. That's going to come into play in a bit. If they were caught keeping the Sabbath, Shabbat, it was considered a crime. It was punishable by death. If they circumcised their child, their baby, the parents and the baby were put to death. Wow. And if you did not follow circumcision, God said, you're cut off from Israel, from the Commonwealth of Israel. So that's why there were those who would still try because they were so afraid of God and disobe being disobedient to God that they still you know, attempted. He went into the temple. And remember, the temple for them is the place where God's dwelling is. It's the, how they had their relationship with God. They didn't have a personal indwelling Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, like we do today. And that all their worship, everything, was took place at the temple. They went to the temple three times a day to pray. They All their, their holy days, everything was around the temple. So when Antiochus Epiphanes went into that temple, he absolutely desecrated it, and that was his intent. He put up a, an idol to Zeus, demanded worship to Zeus, some said. He put up other idols also, and even went to himself, demanding worship for himself. He's definitely a precursor to uh, Titus, to, um, I'll, I'll say Hitler, I'll say Hamas, but to the one coming that we call the Antichrist, who will set himself up in the temple and declare to be God and declare that all bow down to him or is off with their heads. So we see what's coming is nothing new. It's foreshadowed by the past. So um, he put, he slew a pig, a non-kosher animal on the altar and then he took the broth from it and sprinkled it all over all the rest of the temple implements, 
desecrating everything. He just absolutely made it it's a, a horrible destruction. He stole the treasures from it. He took those for himself and then just left it as it was. But he put up altars <laughs> everywhere else too, demanding that the Jewish people bow down, sacrifice, and worship at those altars. Yes. Didn't he make the, the priest drink from the blood? Oh, does it sacrifice or is that something different? Some say that, some don't, but it leads into something else that's such a false truth mm -hmm. that goes against the Jews that, um, I'll just know, say that for right now. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and I don't, so I don't know if the roots of it are true or not, but if they, he forced them to eat the pig meat, yeah. and many of them died on the spot for that. Uh, yes? Who was this guy? Was he a king or? Oh. Was, he he was um, he was the ruler of one fourth of Alexander's empire, and he was trying to be the world empire. So he was trying to raise him up. In fact, Epiphanes means he was God manifested, mm -hmm. God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. That's why the Jewish people mm -hmm. nicknamed him Epiphanes, which means the madman, <laughs> which he really was. He was Meshuga. Mm -hmm. He was crazy, and so they used that name. Instead of saying the name, because they wouldn't declare that he was God, but that's he was declaring himself to be God. So he was one of the main head rulers of the the world in in that time. And this is coming down now. I should have said that Alexander died in in the three hundreds. We're in one sixty eight, one sixty seven B.C. There's going to be the battle that comes on it, and he loses by one sixty five or one sixty four, depending on whose whose um, historical. Uh, records you are reading. Um, does that explain it enough, Dora? Mm -hmm. Did that explain enough? Okay, okay. Um, I think I've told you everything. Um, the Hashmonians, if you hear about them during this time, um, their dynasty rebelled against this. But when it came to that, they were more like the Hasidim of today. They were the religious Jews, and they were great at being religious, but they weren't great at war. However, there was a little, a little group that God is going to work through. Modin is a place that's very close to Jerusalem, and in Modin there was an elderly um, Jewish priest, Mattathias by name. He could not go along with what he was seeing, and he was near one of those altars that had been set up, and he saw another Jewish man coming to sacrifice, do everything that he was supposed to do to, to spare his life, and Mattathias, in a rage of anger, raised up, and he killed that man in, in that fit of anger. And then realizing what he had done and knowing what he was going against, he fled into the Judean hills to hide for his own safety. His sons went with him. They're famous to this day. That their, Judah is the oldest son, Judah, and there are others. There were five sons. They're usually called the Maccabees. And when you say the Maccabees, that's okay. But when he's called Judah Maccabee, everybody thinks that was his first name and his last name. But it wasn't. Judah would have been known as Judah ben Mattathias, the son of Mattathias. They didn't have last names, surnames like we have today. So how did they get that name Maccabee? Well, as I said, they were small. And they were very religious, but they also, the younger sons were a little bit wiser in guerrilla war tactics. They knew the lay of the land. They were able to trap some of the Syrian army against the hills of uh, Judea because they knew where to go to lead them into to a dead end. And they were able to beat them back. As they continue to, to push, they're going to be able to capture, recapture Jerusalem, finally Judea, and then eventually all of Israel, so that they do push back 65,000 plus, the best army of the world at that time, well-fed, well-trained, and here's just a little renegade of Jewish people. But you know their secret? Their secret was the God of Israel. And they took a, a lesson from the pages of their Torah scrolls. In Shemot, in Exodus 15, 11, it says, Micha mocha ba'alim Yehovah. Who is like thee among the gods, Jehovah? And in essence, what it's declaring is, we've got the one true and living God. Who is like, any of these gods are nothing like our God. 
and raising that banner, looking to their God to redeem them as he did the children of Israel through the Red Sea and away from the Egyptian army. In that day, they declared that's what God would do for them. And God was faithful to them, seeing their hearts and their cry out to him. And he gave this little group victory, victory, victory. And as I said, first it was Yerushalayim and then it, it, it grows. But as soon as they had enough control, had pushed the Syrian army back far enough, they wanted to reestablish their temple worship. That was more important to them than building their homes, taking care of anything for themselves. So they immediately set about to uh, refurbish, to cleanse, to set up this uh, temple where they could worship again. And they wanted to dedicate it back to the Lord and Hanukkah means dedication, so that's how the name comes. Hanukkah, you get other meanings also, it's come to mean today, but that's the original meaning out of the Hebrew. And on the 25th of Kislev, which for us was last Thursday night at sundown, that was the date this year, it, it commemorated the very day that they rededicated the temple back to their God, that they had cleansed it, purified it, it was ready for temple uh, worship once again. Some say, and I don't have any way to prove it, yay or nay, but some say that when the battle started against the Antiochus Epiphanes, it was on the 25th of Kislev. And that's why when they were so close to that date, they pushed to have that be the very date that they could declare, we won, he's out, our God reigns. And they rededicated the temple. Now, in the temple is to always be an eternal light. And that eternal light represents to us the God of Israel, who is eternal, who is the light of the world, who continues on, who was the light of the world prior to temple worship, at temple worship, at the time of Hanukkah, and even today and into our future, and all the way in Revelation 21 and 22, the very end of what we know is the end of the beginning, because we're going to go into eternity future, but even there, the light is still not just burning, but it's the light of our of our abode. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, read those chapters on your own. But uh, they they were have an eternal light in the the temple always. Um, that's from Shmuel from Exodus when they first made the tabernacle, which was the mobile temple until they could establish in Jerusalem that this was where the house of God would be permanent. So the story is told that while they were cleansing the temple grounds, that they found a cruise of oil that was still pure, it was still kosher. And it would, had about enough supply for a day. So they started it right away, get the light going, and the story is that miraculously, the one day supply burned for eight days until the new olive oil was made by the kosher standards was ready to be poured in and the light continued on and it didn't go out. And so we celebrate eight days because of the miracle of the lights, the oil for eight days. Now whether that part is factual or that's a tradition that's been added in, our people argue about it. They love to argue. Three Jews, four opinions. It's just the way it is. But if it's not from the oil, then the eight days would have come maybe from Sukkot, which was the holy day they had just missed on the calendar, the last one. That's for eight days. That celebrates that God brought them through the wilderness and into the promised land. And maybe they felt like God's brought us through a wilderness and into our promised temple. So it could be that they drew on it for that. And there are other symbolic meanings for eight in our Jewish traditions. I won't go into those now. But regardless of which way, it came to be known as the Festival of Lights because of the lights, because of this going on. And that's by the time Josephus is recording in 1st century AD, he called it the Festival of Lights. It might have been about 200 by the time he did. But anyway, um, they, uh, oh, I, I'm seeing things that I forgot to tell you. But that's okay. Let me go on with the, it, usually they're called menorahs. And you hear that, that common. But in actuality for Hanukkah, we call it a Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. And it's different from our menorahs because our menorahs are like what's in the temple that's seven branched. One main and then three on each side that feed off of that one main branch. But you'll see in my menorah here in the menorahs that are around, you see the nine instead of, of um, the seven. And you'll have to say, now wait a minute, you're talking nine. It's eight days. Why nine? 
Stay tuned. You'll see why nine. <laughs> You'll see why one's raised a little higher than the others, but we'll get to that as we do. But they'll burn the candles each night, burning more each night, and they took these these Hanukkiah and they put them in the window or in the threshold of the doorway to shine the light out because it wasn't to keep it to ourselves but to shine out and tell out what God has done and to show the victory. So in the dark, dark nights, because they're getting to the winter solstice, to the shortest um, day and the longest dark night, and with no, you know, there, there weren't lights and lampposts and all of that, it was very dark. And then when you'd hit a Jewish community and you'd see all these lights, Wow. You can see why Josephus called it the Festival of Lights. And it's caught on, and we call it that to this day. So that some will even argue and say, that's what Hanukkah means. <laughs> that literally is dedication. Yes? Before we go any further, I didn't hear you tell me or, or say if uh, the people that fought off whatever they did, their name was not Maccabee. Oh, I started and I stopped. Thank you. I stopped short. Yeah. Yes, when I give you that battle cry, Micha, Mocha, Baalim, Yehovah, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, uh, and that's, Shmo, that's Exodus 15, 11. If you take the first letter off of the Hebrew words, who is like unto thee, O God, among the gods, actually, who is like unto thee, O God, it's Micha is the M. Mocha, again, you have your M. Micha, Mocha. <laughs> no, I can't do it. Um, Baalim. Baalim. I couldn't, I had to see it in my Hebrew, sorry. Micha, Mocha, Baalim. There's your B sound. You've got the, the M sound. You've got the C or the K sound, the B sound. And then the Yehovah is the E on the end. So it's an acronym for that phrase. So that when you say Maccabee, you're saying, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Mm -hmm. So it was declaring. So that's how they got to be known as the Maccabees, because their battle cry was a Maccabean cry. And that was just a, a shorter way of not having to say the whole phrase. So Judah, when he's called Judah the Maccabee, it, it, it's a misnomer. They'll say, well, that means he hammered out the enemy. Well, how did he hammer out the enemy? In the power of God. He did it by that battle cry. I say it's like raising the banner and going under that banner into battle because that's what they would do. They would raise their banners, their ensigns, and they'd go into battle, and that was what uh, the Judah and his family did. And so they, it became known to this point that, like I say, it's almost considered their last name now. But thank you, because I did forget to bring that out. And I also didn't tell you when, and I, then I'll get to you, Rowena, in one second. Um, also, when they, I told you how they'd hidden some of the scrolls in the Judean hillsides, and the religious would go out to those caves that lived, you know, near there in Jerusalem, and they wanted to study those scrolls in secret. But if the Syrian army would catch them, of course, it would be death. So they would hide the scrolls, they'd bring them out, they'd be in the cave uh, studying, and it said that they learned Hebrew in every direction. If you sat sideways, you learned to read it sideways because they were so hungry to study the Word of God, and they had so few scrolls. But they had to have a cover if, they, if the soldiers came so they wouldn't know what was going on. So out of the clay, the Judean clay, they made these little, what looks like a top, this is plastic, okay, but it looks like a little top, and it is a spinning item like our tops, and it's kind of like a gambling game, and they made it look like that, like that's all they were doing was just passing the time by playing a game, and the soldiers would see that and think that they were harmless and would go on. As soon as they went on, they'd put the dreidels away, they'd pull the scrolls back out, and they'd go on studying. So this was their cover story. They bring that into our remembrance and our celebrations today. The children love to play. It's called dreidel. Dreidel is spinning top, and they love to play it, and they gamble for Hanukkah gelt, which is chocolate coins. Who does not want to win chocolate coins? <laughs> and kids of all ages love to play it. But as the Jewish people do, they always look for a way to pass the story down to their children also. So it's hard to see on these, 
But and by the way, here's the Hanukkah gelt. Comes in little packages, but there's little coins inside. They've got an imprint of a menorah, or they'll say something about the Maccabee or the dreidel, you know, on the different coins. But on the actual dreidel themselves, remember they were they were made out of clay. They started carving or imprinting on the sides a different Hebrew letter. And just like the Maccabees are different letters, the M, the C, the B, and the E sound, they, they put on this Neskidal Haya um, Sham. A great miracle happened there. So they took the N, the Noon, and they took the Neskidal, the G, the Gimel, they took the Hay, um, I may be out of order, but the Hay and the Shin are the, the four Hebrew letters. If you buy your dreidel in Israel, though, it's very significant that you will not say a great miracle happened there. It'll say a great miracle happened here. So they have a different letter. They have the, the P sound, the Pope, is what they have for their dreidels. But other than that, it looks the same. And as little children, and I mean real little, can learn to play dreidel, they're quick to say, what miracle happened where? And they get the story, so it teaches them, and it's a fun setting, and they get their Hanukkah guilt. Um, they like to share gifts, but they stress this is not a Jewish Christmas. The two have nothing to do with each other. The only similarity they can have is, I will tell you, the light of the world that we celebrate being born at, at, at this time is the light that was from of old that is the significant point of our Hanukkah celebration also. But that takes Messianic believers, uh, we say Messianic Judaism, Jewish Christian, Hebrew Christian, it takes the blend to know and see how the two come together and tell the whole story. Rowena. Oh. He's working on it too. Okay, try it again. I'm going to go get another piece of that because that's good. Uh, during the days of Jesus, when he uh, celebrated with the Jewish people the Feast of Dedication, were the lampstands menorahs or Hanukkiahs, the big ones? By the time Yeshua is celebrating it, I'm going to say there's a good chance that they had made uh, a, the Hanukkiah shape. Um, it's hard to say. Um, because the temple menorah, which was huge, would have been the seven branch, but because they're celebrating for eight days, I think by the time you get to Yeshua, it's a day, 100 and, uh, what, 140, at, at over 150 years later, I think they probably were lighting Hanukkiahs by then. Mm -hmm. I think that they have. It is interesting, I just learned this, that the big menorahs we see being lit in different cities, usually by the Chabad, the ultra-religious Jewish people, that they went public with that in 1973 after the Yom Kippur War. Before that, it was always in our homes and in our private celebrations. It wasn't on public display, but those have been put out on public display. When Yeshua is celebrating, and I should tell you, I probably would say it later too, but in case if I forget, because there's so much that goes through my mind and I don't do well with that. Um, John, Yochanan, chapter 10, and verses 22 and 23. Let me, let me call that up. Since this is our Bible class, we are going to look at different scriptures for the days in just a moment also, so you may want your Bible handy. I will read for you the scriptures, but you may want to also have it. 22 and 23. John 10, 22 and 23. And while Yochanan. Doing, while you're doing that too, isn't the menorah they used to, during battle times, they put them on the mountains and light them up? Or is that something else I'm thinking of? I don't know. Light the whole valley could see. I don't know. I have to look that up. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, but I don't know. And I definitely am not a know-it-all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to call up, and I want to read it first for you. And um, I'll do the American, New American Standard. There we go. Okay, John 10. And, well, I'll just call up 10 and I can scoot down to, because my tablet's running slow. Come on, here we go. There we go, I just got out of Genesis. Okay, all right. We read here in our New American, you know, just a common um, English version for us. 
At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple area in the portico of Solomon. Now, if you don't have a Jewish background or you haven't had a Jewish teacher, what did you get out of those two verses? You got a lot of Jewish words that you really don't know what's being said. Feast of Dedication, what's that? Jerusalem, hopefully you know where that is. But Jesus in the temple area, you might understand that. But what's this portico of Solomon? Well, let me read it to you in the complete Jewish Bible. It says, Then came Hanukkah in Yerushalayim. Remember Hanukkah, Feast of Dedication, or Dedication. Then came Hanukkah in Yerushalayim. It was winter, and Yeshua was walking around inside the temple area in Shlomo's colonnade. Now, again, if you don't have the Jewish background, you don't know what Shlomo's colonnade is, but that's the area that would be equal to, like, in your churches today, your fellowship hall where you'll have potlucks and you'll have celebrations of all kinds. That's where you come together and you celebrate. That's what is being said. So if Yeshua is walking in the temple area in the place where they'd be celebrating and it's at the Feast of Dedication, is at Hanukkah, what do you think he's doing? Obviously, he's celebrating Hanukkah at the temple with his Jewish brethren. So that to me gives a stamp of approval, even though it's not a commanded holy day, it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with celebrating it, and I think that it is right for us to celebrate. So there's our scriptural basis. The only time that, that we know where it talks about um, Yeshua celebrating um, this holiday is at this time. Uh, a lot of our history is given to us in the book of Maccabees. There's two books that are called First and Second Maccabees. They're in the apocryphal books. Again, when we look at the apocryphal books, we realize they're good history, but we're not saying that every word is inerrant from God, like we do for the books that are in our Bible, in our original covenant, and in the Brilch Adashah. Those that have gone through testing, criteria, that um, was accepted as, these are the ones that we know are 100% inerrant by God, and these others are good books, but we can't hold them up to that same level. So we look at it, we get our history from it, but like you've already even heard me say, one historian says it happened in 165 BC, another says 164 BC. Now, by the time you get to 22 or 2023, you're going to say, does it really matter? It's just a year, just a drop in the bucket. No, it really doesn't matter, but back in that time, you know, I'm sure it did matter. For us, if our scriptures were as loose as that, that they could be, oh, well, that doesn't matter, we won't worry about being exact. No, that could open us up to all kinds of trouble, but God didn't let them. He kept the purity of the word of God. Every word is 100% accurate and trustworthy. That can only happen by God being the author, not by man. Mm -hmm. And we know that he inspired man to write what was written. They wrote far beyond themselves. They agree from beginning, from cover to cover, from, though they come from every walk of life, over, what, 1,500 years, over 40 authors, like I say, every walk of life, every difference you could have, and yet they agree. You won't find that kind of agreement in something that happens at one time today. You know, just try it sometime. Have a group of people, let something happen, let that go through the room, and then ask people, okay, what did you see? Who did it? What you know? And start asking specific questions. What were they wearing? How tall were they? And you'll be shocked at all the different answers you'll get. It's like playing gossip on the you know old can. You know, by the time they got down the line, it had changed. But God saw to the accuracy. There's not one thing that changes. It's all accurate. So why did I get off on that? I don't know. I don't remember. But they celebrate as a family. They light the, the, the candles. They light one more each night to show the miracle got bigger. They sing songs. Some over here are already singing, I have a little dreidel. And maybe at the end of class I can show another video. It's about five minutes long, so I won't take class time right now. But it's really cute. Um, it's, a, it's a more modern take on I have a little dreidel. Um, but, we, you know, it's a lot of fun. Um, as I mentioned, some will give gifts to remember, you know, what God has done. They love to give to charity at this time. Remember, God has blessed them. They want to bless others, you know, that sort of thing. 
Um, I think I, oh, and they eat foods fried in oil to remember the oil, the miracle of the oil. Mm -hmm. So potato pancakes called latkes are, you absolutely have to eat a latke during Hanukkah. <laughs> Some will eat them every night. They've got a good excuse to eat food fried in oil. They have special donuts. They're jelly filled. They're called sufganiot, and that's because they're fried in oil, make them a special way. Okay, why do they make uh, the pancakes or whatever you call out of potatoes? Is there a, a significance to the potatoes? Not to well, the that's potatoes. What they had, it what? was just yeah, a common ingredient everywhere. It could be fried and could be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so McDonald's didn't make the first hash browns, folks. <laughs> yeah. Now all of this centers around the Hanukkah. It all centers around the light. It centers around the miracle of the light. And we as Jewish believers see so much more significance in the lights. And we also see significance in each day. Each day will start off with the same prayers, and I'll tell you that in a moment, and I'll show you how they light the candles. But at the same time, I have to tell you once again, three Jews, four opinions. So um, I was given, under um, a revered rabbi, I was given what the days stand for. But I'll be honest, if you sit under another rabbi somewhere else, you'll get different meanings for the days. I've even seen a couple of versions go around this year that are different than I've heard before. So I'm not telling you that the, the days that I'm giving you are inerrant, but I am telling you it was taught, it is passed down, it is tradition, it's what was in my family, and it was very significant to me. Because as I looked at it and I saw the relation to the light of the world, it blesses me. And that's what I want to share for our Bible class today is the significance of each of those days, um, what they mean, and you will see. As we go on, I think you'll catch on as to why that's so important to me. And I'm looking for where I put my prayer. Because I don't, I have the first part, there it is. I have the first part memorized, but not all the parts. Now, um, as I mentioned, it has to be an eight-branched, there we go. Sorry, I've got too many papers up here. I want to keep that handy, and I want to keep that handy. Okay. Uh, they have to have a place for eight days, but they use a special candle called a shamash. That means servant. They use that candle to light all the other candles, and so it's raised a little higher. That's why it's not a ninth day. It is a ninth candle, or in this case, the first candle, and in my tradition, it's always got to be pure white. You will see all kinds of colors and all kinds of ways of doing it, but because of what it represents, I always use the white. And I'm going to put it in, and then as I do the candles, the each day I'll show you how we light the menorah. But there's our shamash candle, pure and white, standing tall, taller than all the others, and yet it's going to stoop down to bring the light into each of the days. Okay? So, they gather together, they gather around the menorah, their latkes are frying, and their donuts might be frying too, and of course they eat more than just that, but it is very much a celebration time, family time. And as always, all of our holy days, all of our gatherings, we always have these blessings that are given. And so, at Hanukkah time, they simply just change a few of the words, and they'll start out and they'll say, Baruch HaTad Anai, Eloheinu Melcha Alam, Asher Kiddachonu, B'mizvotav, Bitsivanu, Lahad Lik Ner Shel Hanukkah. Now, if you've heard me before, that sounded very familiar until I got to the end, and it is. It starts off, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments, and enjoined us to kindle the Hanukkah lights. That's just the ending where it changes. And then they go on to verse 2 and verse 3, which again is praising our God. It's, we praise you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who performed wondrous deeds for our ancestors in days of old at this season. They're recalling the miracle. Third verse, we praise you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this season. 
After saying those special prayers, giving God the glory and recognizing as a miracle at his hands, then they're ready to light the candle of the first night. Mm -hmm. Now, how am I going to do this? I think I'm going to try to do it the way you all are looking at it. What so, verses were, were those that you were reading? <clears throat> those are the um, Hebrew prayers. Mm -hmm. They're not scripture. They're oh, not a oh, scripture reference. Prayer. Yeah, it's just our Hebrew prayers. We say that same prayer at the start of Shabbat, and we end up saying, you know, that we're lighting the Sabbath candles. It's just, it's traditional to carry on. We're always remembering as God. He's king of the universe. He has sanctified us. He has given us life. He sustained us. We're always remembering those things. Even when we do the Kiddush at the end of Shabbat also, where we have the blessing over the, the bread and the wine or the juice, we say we start out the same way. Blessed are you, Lord God, king of the universe. But then it, has a name. Is it, it Was it Shema or what's the name of it? The servant candle? Shamash. Huh? Shamash. S H A M. But the, the, the name of the prayer. Oh, oh, Shachihenu. Shachihenu. <laughs> There's three big words. That's only the first one. <laughs> but yes, Shachihenu are the special blessings, or the extra blessings. Sick probably could mean both. <laughs> but yes, yes. So they're going to start, and this time my candles all are going to match, but like I say, you can use any colors, and not everybody sticks to the pure white, but I like that because you'll see as I go on why I'm saying that. You start on the right side, so I'm doing backwards, I'm doing it right for the, the camera. You start on the right, and you're going to light the shamash candle first, then you're going to use it to light the other candle, and then those two would burn down the first night. The second night, you put in a new candle in the next slot, and when you take your shamash candle to light, you'll light the newest first, and then go to the old. So just just so you know the the kosher way to light it. <laughs> They've got their traditions. What would we do without our traditions? So before I explain the shamash candle, let me go ahead and start, and I'll do day one, and I'm going to go ahead and light. And the flat, the um, candles I chose today remind me of the flag of Israel. It's my way of connecting with Israel, and I actually had the privilege of attending um, via the internet, but a worldwide Hanukkah celebration, first night of Hanukkah. And I cannot tell you the, just what resonated in this little Jewish heart to connect with the Jews in Bolivia and Argentina, and in Israel, and in New York, and in Beverly Hills, and you know, they just, they took us all over the world, and it wasn't in order, we just, you know, they popped up, and you could hear the similarities in the celebrations, you could hear the, the differences too, from uh, the language and the, the accent, to just, we, we take our traditions, but the culture, the area influences a bit also. So it was just very, very interesting, very sweet, very loving. And I think because of what's going on in the world, and we know anti-Semitism is worldwide right now, it just, it just did spur us on to feel that connection and to realize they're not wiping us out. God's promise. The Jew will always survive because God promised, and he will fulfill his promises. And he's the light of the world that doesn't know any power failure. Ha <laughs> ha! That's my God. <laughs> so we light the shamash candle. Okay, there we go. I think it got, yeah, it did that time. And then it stoops down and it lights the first night. And they'll sing the prayer that I just gave. I said it. They'll sing it if they're a family that has melody. I can't sing, folks, so I say, okay, while it's being stubborn, it's going to, I guess I had too much wax on here. Oh, come on, it's got to light. If it doesn't, we're going to get a new candle. Oh. <laughs> okay. Is it dripping wax on it? It's, it, the wax is melting, that's why I thought it would finally, this one feels good, and it, this one I think will connect very well, and I think there's probably enough sticky stuff in there, there we go. All right, here we go. We will try again. And right from the start, as we get the meaning of the first night, 
And by the way, I am giving one of the most common what the eight days mean. I think it's just like our dreidel song that I told you. They've got the dreidel song usually tells the history through verses that are fun for the kids to sing with. And now we've got um, a rendition that's just a fun story for our people that it's got a cute ending. That's why if I can in the end, I'll do it. But the first will, the rabbis will either say it stands for light. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> there you go. And that's what I always think too. Light or life. Now, light causes us to reflect on the words of Melch David, King David. And he stated in Tehillim, in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Mm -hmm. And if you think about those menorahs, those Hanukkiahs that were in the threshold, just like we have the mezuzah on the doorpost today to remind us of God's word as we go in and we go out, as they would go out, if they went out at night, even just sing it, they would realize it was a light to their feet. I wonder if it made them think of this verse. And does that tradition carry on today? Believe it or not, in San Bernardino, California, in a normal department store, I found a Hanukkah for the threshold this year. Wow. It's actually the first time I've seen one that was made just for the threshold. Wow. Uh, you know, right now, they, they have this little thing going at, at square at the San Bernardino court square or whatever and uh they have like uh, lights all over the place and i was there the other day and they even have a a, a menorah and they have a, a la hanukkah bear i think for sure that, and uh, it was really cute in san Bernardino city hall square uh-huh i'll have to go see it yes thank you for telling me just in time because because we're going to be on day seven i gotta hurry to go see it <laughs> oh six o'clock do they light it each night at six yes Whoa, thank you, thank you. Right in my own backyard, the things we don't know. <laughs> um, we're just past also Tuesday night, the Tuesday night of Hanukkah, no matter where it falls. I don't know what they do if it falls on the first, but anyway, uh, in Riverside, the Chabad is a big, they block off the streets and they have a lot of fun from dancing and singing to, you know, some people that they've picked to share, you know, some, some words also. Um, I haven't known of San Bernardino what San Bernardino is doing, so I guess we're catching on. That's great. Well, as I said, it stands for light. And our, our prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah, in chapter 2, and verse 5 says, Come house of Yaakov. Jacob, hmm, this one that we're studying right now. Come house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So when I see light, right away it makes me think of my Jewish scriptures. And I want to show you that the Jewish scriptures don't stop with the original covenant. They continue on into the Brit Hadashah. Because remember, it's one book, it's one long story. It is his story. It is his story, his story through history from Bereshit to the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, who he is. So I see also that Yeshua claimed to be the light of the world. I am the light of the world, he said in Yochanan in John chapter 8 and verse 12. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now when you see the menorahs that Rowena asked about from the temple area, there were four 75-foot tall menorahs. Now, I don't know. I think they were seven-branched, but they probably made a Hanukkah 75 feet tall at that time. And the light that would go off would be seen through the hills of Jerusalem. Maybe that's, that's what you're remembering. Yeah, that definitely that would be going on. That would be quite a light. And the, the city that was set on the hill in that light could not be hidden. Matthew 5 refers to that also. But Yohanan, John, also declared, in him, in this one who said he was the light of the world, in him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it, or what it means, the darkness doesn't suppress it. The darkness can't overrule. The darkness has to flee. The light is what is seen. That's Yohanan, John, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and verse 9. There was the true light which came into the world, enlightening every man. And light is to enlighten. That's why we use the, when we get an idea, oh, the light bulb goes off. Because 
we're enlightened. Now we, we get it and we move on in it. And in that way, we see that Yeshua is dispelling the darkness. He's the one that gives us life. Life is the light of man. We know that life is precious and that God gave it through his son, Yeshua. Gave that precious gift of his life that we might have abundant life. And he talks about that again in Yochanan in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. This is the one who would give his life, but would resurrect from the dead, so that he is resurrection and life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet he lives, and he who believes in me will never die. He was referring to soul and to the physical. The physical can die, but the soul goes on living so that this one never dies in Yeshua. We go on and we live with him when we leave this earth. So Yeshua came to bring us that life. And when we know that the Shamish candle is called the servant candle, that reminds us of Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 42 says, Come, listen, hear my servant, my righteous one. And then chapter 53 talks about this servant, gives it in the picture of the, the sacrificed lamb, that in verse 11 refers to the righteous servant who would give his life a ransom for many. Very much a picture of what Yeshua would do as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, which is what Yochanan also called him, John called him, in chapter 1 and verse 29. You've heard me say it many a time. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he, he pointed to Yeshua who was coming on the scene right there at that moment. So we see the picture. We see it developing. And notice also how the servant candle stoops down. Usually the candles are shorter. It stoops down to light the others. And we know Yeshua stooped down from heaven to bring the light into the heart of each who will receive. And they are the ransomed. They are the ones, the many. The many is those who will believe. So Yeshua is the light that freely gives us abundant life. And that's our day one. Then day two, those have burned down and we're putting in three new candles on day two, but we're just going to move forward and just put in one new candle. Day two stands for reason. And when we hear reason, we hear Yeshahu, Isaiah, our prophet say, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they are crimson, they will be like wool. That's Isaiah 1, verse 18. And I really thought I picked one that these are just drowning in the wax. There we go. Maybe I have to aim a little higher, I think, and not get down to the waxy part. Maybe it's my own fault. <laughs> so day two is the, the fact that we as human beings are separated from the rest of God's creation because we have that ability to reason. We have that ability to think. The fact that our God, our creator, has given us that ability, to, our minds show us there is a maker. There's a master designer. This mind didn't just evolve, folks. I cannot understand how... Anyone using their mind could believe that this mind, as complex as it is, could just improve to that point. And if so, then why isn't man improving now? Why are we seeing worse? Why do we see barbarism like we've seen in this world recently? Enough said there. But what an invitation. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Our reasoning should lead us to God our maker and we should realize that in him he's saying there's a way for complete forgiveness. There's a way to wipe the slate clean. I don't know anyone who's made it to adult life that doesn't have something they wish they didn't do or something they wish they could have changed or you know, just thought better later, just that, that quick reaction and, and wow, I wish I could go back and redo that. God in essence is giving us a restart. We're able to wipe that slate clean. We're able to erase the mistakes, erase the sin in his shed blood so that we can take on that newness of life and one day we'll realize that in his purity, in his cleanliness, we're able to come into God's presence because we come in wrapped in Messiah's garment. We're wrapped in his righteousness because scripture tells us, Isaiah 64 Verse 4, that our righteousness is like filthy rags. 
even what we think is our best against a holy God and his standard is impure. But God doesn't see us in our best. Hallelujah. He sees us in his best, mm -hmm. in his righteousness. And that's the greatest gift that can be given. And that does take our the stain of our sin and wash it away so that we're seen as pure, white, holy like him. So, in our reasoning, may we come to Elohim, our maker. May we allow him to not only forgive us from the past, but be our reasoning guide to guide us in our future so that we do live according to the light and the life that has come into the world for us. Which brings us to day three. And day three is, uh, stands for truth. And that's easy for us to think, is it not? You know, if we didn't have truth, we would stumble around in the darkness. But they say truth gives, it's, it dispels darkness, it brings freedom, it nourishes happiness, it opens one's eyes. You know, the, you get the truth and you'll go, aha, now I know. We hear that, we say that, but do we stop and think? And we know that there's only one way to be set free. And that is the one who said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's Yohanan, John 8, verse 32. Well, who, you'll know the truth. How do you know the truth? You can know the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Remember, life is our day one, so it's all tying in. The one who gives life is the one who speaks truth, the one who gives the truth, the one who is the truth and says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And through the truth, light comes into the life of man, brings him that life, that abundant life we just talked about in day two. And now we know that we can have this now and for all of eternity. Because in that truth, we know the way to go home and live with our Father in heaven, our Creator God, forever and ever. Is that not beautiful? Amen. <laughs> Maybe that's why day four stands for beauty. It just fits, doesn't it? <laughs> day four reminds us that God's given us that ability to appreciate the beauty that is all around us. He has created for us a beautiful world. And I don't know where you were today, in our day here in Southern California, we have a gorgeous day. The Amen. sun is out Amen. and shining. The hills are beautiful. It's it, windy. It's, yes, it is windy, but boy, is the valley gorgeous. <laughs> 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 and we do see beauty, but there's a greater beauty. There's a beauty that our, our King David, Melchabi, our psalmist said, I seek this beauty. It's recorded for us in chapter 27 and verse 4 of the Psalms. And he says, and this is David speaking, One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. And he is beautiful, is he not? What a beautiful picture we're getting of him, truth and life and the way and and oh my goodness, it, it just it gets brighter and brighter and better and better. This is the beauty. And like Dovey, that's what we want, is to dwell in his presence, see his beauty forever and ever. Eternal life in the presence of Elohim promised to us through his son, through Yeshua, through the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We could sum up all our days. We're just on one side. We've got another side to go. But we could sum it up and we could say it this way. He's come to give us abundant life through using our minds to reason the truth so that we can appreciate the beauty of Elohim and allow his beauty to be upon us and to shine through us. That's just half of our menorah, but is that not beautiful? Yes. And I'm reminded also in Psalm 90 and verse 17, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And when his beauty is on us, even in the midst of ashes, beauty comes out. And that's what we read in Yeshua, Isaiah 61, and verse 3, the beginning. It says, to appoint unto those who mourn in Zion, in Zion, in Jerusalem, to give them beauty for ashes. Mm -hmm. Remember the rocket that we start with in Sederot? 
the rockets that were meant to kill the Israelis and they picked up those mortar shells and they made a menorah out of it and they're lighting them beauty out of the ashes. That's why it just really resonated with me. I thought, wow, wow, that I would love to light one of those days on that menorah. Blow it and blow. I'm sorry? Blow it and blow those shells. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're empty. They'd make sure. <laughs> make sure. But to enjoy this beauty forever. Do you realize that? Roger, we just lost, um, I hope, only um, picture, but I don't know if I've lost my audience, my Zoom audience. Computers resetting. Something. So did we, are we disconnected? Yeah, it is blowing pretty fast. The yeah, it shouldn't matter because, uh, the, you know, the connections isn't through lines like in the past. Well, I know we are connected. We are connected, and I'll go on and teach us. <laughs> well, it looks like the computer's restarting. So we, yeah, so we're yeah. shut out. Well, we got the half. Now we'll come for the second half. <laughs> but we'll wait and let them get back and Everything's up. plugged in. It just suddenly went. Yeah, that's what's weird. <laughs> is it restarting? Yeah, computer just did. Okay, it's just. That's weird. Oh, wow. Do you need me to close the curtain for you? Yeah, it's above a curtain, I think. Oh. Yeah, it's up there. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I know because yeah. Yeah, and they've got little hooks in them. I often think I need to find something that I can make that I could go on that angle, you know, so I could close it off. Um, I love light, but when we're having meetings, I don't want the in the eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> and I've sat there, you know, it's hit me before. There's our future, Genesis chapter 30. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't let it do updates. No, I think that program I've got to get rid of. Okay. No, I'm fine, thank you. They should all still be online anyways. Yeah, but they're probably wondering what happened to us. And hopefully they know, stay put. Yay, they waited for me. Wait, wait, miracle wait. of miracles. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, okay, it's not on yet. It's not it, it, it was just oh, you. I yeah, I went down, but they all stayed. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, now you talk. Shalom, everyone. <laughs> we have no idea, but miracle of miracles, we are back together. I think it was perfect timing that the one half was done, and we're ready to go to our other half. We were just saying in our, our last note that to enjoy that beauty forever in the presence of our Creator that's promised to us through the sun, I don't think anything could be more beautiful. But we are going to go on and add more beauty to our Hanukkah. And I hope that you're all hearing okay. Any of you who have a picture there, if you can give me a thumbs up, good, thank you. Okay. Yeah, they, said then, you, they said you froze, but then the I computer froze. shut down. Oh, okay, yeah, our computer completely shut down. We had to reboot. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but thank you for staying. <laughs> so, day five. Now we're on the other side. And if I were lighting, I would start with it, and then you go back down to the first one each night. Day five stands for love. 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 L-O-V-E, love. We love love. Yes. They say that love is the warmest light because it's the richest reward of life. And, yeah, life without love, no thank you. But the love, the greatest love that we see, is perfectly exemplified in the life-giving, atoning work of God's Son, our Messiah, our Savior. And we see, we read first, before we get to what's probably popping in your mind, let me take you to the Jewish roots. Viacra, Leviticus 17, 11, says, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I, God, have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. What that's telling us is what we see revealed completely in our new covenant, in our Brita Chodeshah, where we read that Yeshua freely laid his life down. And through the power of Elohim, because he was very God himself, he raised up three days later. He conquered sin. The wage of, of sin is death. He conquered death. He paid the penalty. He paid it for all mankind. That's why he had to take on human flesh, was to rescue human flesh. 
And he tells us in Yochanan John 15, 13, that there's no greater love than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And later he wrote in 1 Yochanan, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, to be the atonement for our sins. And, and that's 1 John. First John 4, verses 9 and 10. And all I can say to that is my great big adult vocabulary of, <laughs> wow. <laughs> but when you think about it, he loved us so much that he stooped down from heaven to bring the light that we can reason and know the truth. The beauty of the truth that will set us free as we move into and become a part of that love, exchanging his shed blood in our place so that we can have that relationship, that abundant life with him. There is no better word that really covers it than wow. No greater gift, no greater love than the warmth of God's love and it's free to all who will just simply accept it. His atoning work for all. Earlier the scripture said it was for many that's only because all will not accept but that many includes all who will accept. When we get to day six we're thinking again of what our circumstances surrounding us but it does come out of the scripture out of uh, Tehillim Psalm 82 and verse 3. I'll read that for you in a moment. I think I've got it written down. I can tell you what it says. <laughs> But day six stands for justice. And there's a famous quote, and that's what's in uh, Psalm 82 and verse 3. And that is, justice, justice, thou shalt pursue. And we're told that we are to do justice to everyone, to the afflicted, to the needy, that we're to treat them justly. We're to seek for that, but we're to exemplify that. And Micha, Micah, chapter 6 and verse 8 says, He has told you, old man, what is good. God's told you what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So Jewish people are being told in this day of rededication that they are to live justly. How do you live justly? Mm. Through truth in action. There's your day three. It ties back in. What was that at, Michelle? Uh, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 and I also read for you or I think I did let me look up Psalm 82 3 I think I yeah. gave you the synopsis uh, let me make sure I quoted it right because if I'm stopping to think I want to make sure I do it right Psalm 82 and verse 3 yes vindicate the weak the fatherless do justice to the afflicted and destitute rescue the weak and needy save them from the hand of the wicked that's three and four and that's what we're to do we're to, to look to how we can do justice to those who injustices are being done to that's why i will tell you very clearly we are not ever saying that the arabs are not people that matter they are and we want justice done to them also is the terrorists, the, the ones that are bent on nothing but evil and destruction of life that need to be taken out. Mm -hmm. Our hearts cry for the innocent Arabs that are losing their lives in this war also. A huge number because they're used as human shields. They're not given a chance to have their lives valued. And that goes against what we're being taught here, that God is telling us to to value around and to seek to help those who are in need. Uh, Golda May Air said it best. She said, when the Arab people love their children more than they hate the Israelis, mm -hmm. then we will have peace. Mm -hmm. And that really does say a mouthful. But on our track, justice is really truth in action. And according to Yeshua in John 14:6 where he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's how to live justly, is by living in the way, the truth, and the life. By allowing him to work through us, we will do right by those who are around us. And that's what we're being told, treat people with justice. And he brought forth justice to those who were being dealt with in, 
in less than that when he walked this earth. And when we do that, we show forth God's love, the beauty of it. See how all the days keep intertwining and we keep seeing how we grow with all of those days. And ultimately, ultimately, we're given that gift of justice in replacement for our sins. That's where God looks at us just as if we'd never sinned. He looks at us through the atoning blood on the cross, and instead of judging us for our unjust actions, we're given that mercy, that grace, that love. We're giving that freedom to come into the light and have life and have it more abundantly. And Isaiah Yeshahu, Isaiah 53 and verse 6 declares, we're all like sheep. We've all gone astray. We've all turned everyone to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How does the Lord lay on himself? Jehovah the Father on the Son. The Son being very God himself, so who's perfectly uh, human but perfectly divine, was able to, uh, to take that sin and wash it away from us through his perfect shed blood. That's why the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua, Jesus, our Lord, Romans 6, 23. So when we come to Elohim, when we come to God, Yehovah, through Yeshua, we're given justice. We're seeing in a just manner. We praise him for all his ways because that's not something we can do on our own. But then we are to live out a life that reflects that kind of right action. And if we do, if we're living justly, we're walking in the truth, we're reasoning, and, and reasoning not on our own reasoning, but in the power that God's given us to know Him and His ways and to embrace the abundant life that He's telling us about, then we will see, and it won't be worldwide, sadly, until Yeshua is on His throne, but we will see what Day 7 stands for, and that is Shalom. It stands for peace. And we know that the... Uh, how much the Jewish person is taught to want and to know and to love that peace, which is why it's our greeting. We want to say we welcome you in peace, shalom. And we want to say when you're leaving us, go in, shalom, go in peace. And so that's our hello and our goodbye is to be in essence asking for the shalom of God to be brought on you as you come and as you go. It's the heart cry for every Jewish person. And we are taught that the world rests on justice, truth, and then there's peace. When the world is, is acting justly in the truth, and that will come when Messiah is ruling and reigning, that this world will see a thousand years of peace. It won't see that before, I guarantee you. But when our Jewish people ask today, and especially today, with what's going on worldwide, it's not just in Israel, but worldwide against the Jew, will they ever have shalom? Our Holocaust victims that are worried about it coming here, that are worrying about it in, in where they are in a way they never thought they would, and children of Holocaust survivors who are saying, my, my parents or my grandparents always said this, but I couldn't see how it could happen here. And now they're seeing it, so they're asking, will there ever be shalom? Will we ever learn how to get along? Will there ever be peace? And we can give a resounding yes. It will come. I guarantee you it will. There is a day coming as promised to us in our scriptures. It's promised to us that Messiah will bring it. And that's why our religious are crying out and looking for Messiah to come now. What they don't understand is our scriptures told us Messiah would be a suffering servant. A shamish candle first. Then he'll come back in that rolling and reigning kingly position. Set up Israel's head nation and bring shalom to the world. That every individual, whether they're Jewish or whether they're Gentile, can find that shalom now. That shalom is not in the world, and it's nothing that the world gives. And that's why Yochanan again recorded Yeshua's words. John chapter 14 and verse 27. Shalom, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled nor let it be afraid or fearful, because in him is a peace that goes beyond understanding. It goes beyond our circumstances. It is a peace in spite of our circumstances. It's the peace that I stand in right now saying, I know my Israel will get through this. I know she will not be wiped off the face of the map 
like so many in this world want to do to her. And when we accept that atoning work, we allow Yeshua to be in our lives, to bring us the peace that comes from above, not what man can give us. When we see it through his death, his resurrection, our forgiveness of sin, it floods our souls with a peace that does go beyond understanding. And we know that no matter what's happening, if we stay at the foot of the cross, we give our burdens to the Lord, we can exchange them for his peace. Is that not also beautiful? Another angle to that beauty. We can't completely understand. We can't. It just is beyond our words. But any who have been in this faith can attest like me. You know what I'm talking about. And it is true. And it is beyond our human capacity of understanding. And that's why Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer, by supplication, by crying it out, with thanksgiving. Why? Thank you, God, I can cry it out to you. Thank you, God, you hear. Thank you, God, you answer. Thank you, God, you're in control. And when we cry out to him, letting him know our requests, he says, and then the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Mashiach Yeshua, in Messiah Jesus. And it's the one time that I'll say, I think my dad was inspired by God to add two words to scripture, okay? He, he gets a get-out-jail-free pass here. <laughs> because he would add into that, and I always hear it when I hear this <clears throat> verse, where it says, the peace of God surpasses all understanding, he would say, and all misunderstanding. <laughs> He'd add in those two words. Whether you can understand or not, you can trust him, and the peace will come to you. And Yeshahu, Isaiah 26 and verse 3, tells us that when, um, that he will keep his, okay, I quote this one to you all the time, and now I'm tongue twisted and I can't start it, I can only jump into the middle. Um, I, I keep hearing, come let us reason. <laughs> okay, this Did one uses Isaiah 20? 26 and or verse 26. 3. The steadfast mind. Will you, you, God, will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. I hear from the old King James that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Perfect peace is shalom, shalom. If you look up the Hebrew for that verse, that's literally how it's written. That God will give you shalom, shalom when you keep your mind in him. And, uh, and what else does it say? Keep, because you trust in him. Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Believe it or not, one of my favorite verses Just that I can quote right without right. fail, <laughs> except yeah. on the spot in class today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the nation, for the nation of Israel, to know that the future holds a thousand years of peace when Mashiach yeah. sets up his kingdom, can you imagine how they'd feel being told that today in the midst of, <clears throat> of the rockets and in the midst of the terrorists and all that's going on? Yeah. And then to be told... It's not just for you. It's through you. All the rest of the world is going to be blessed with that peace. Oh, this world is aching for that peace. Mm. Aching for it. That God does keep his promises. He does fulfill. Second Shemuel, Second Samuel chapter 7 talks about the eternal kingdom with, with the Lord sitting on the throne. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14 tells about Messiah sit on the throne in victory. Revelation 20 tells us of a millennial. A set, it says it six times in, in 13 verses. Thousand year reign, thousand year reign, thousand year reign. That time will come. And we say even now, oh come Yeshua for this peace that we need for the world. But hallelujah, we can have personal peace before then by being plugged into the light of the world, and trusting him in whatever is going on, whether it's our future we're talking about or Israel's future, because that brings us to day eight, and day eight does stand for future or eternity. All its hope, all that lies in there in infinity, all its possibilities, although we know it's an unknown future. We don't know what it holds. I guarantee you, 
that we did not know on October 6th what we'd find out on October 7th. Mm. It was a sudden shock and a surprise to us. But we know that there is one who knows the future, and we can trust the unknown future to the all-knowing God. And we know that, that he is uh, in control. He is not trying to figure it out or coming up with plan B. He is in control. And he's in such control that he can say in Psalm, in, in Tehillim, Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Mm -hmm. If he's ordering your steps, that's your starts and your stops, which way to turn, when to turn, when to go straight, that's security. Because Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, tells us his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts than our thoughts. So he can direct us in a way that's beyond ourselves, keep us from harm, bring us through harm, and we can have that shalom, that we don't have to worry. What's the circumstance? What's happening? Even when they are horrendous circumstances. We're going to see as we go on through Bereshit, through Genesis, we're going to come to a time we studied Yaakov's son, Joseph. <coughs> we just got him born. We're going to grow him up, and he's going to... To in young years, probably around 17 years of age, he's going to get sold, thrown in a pit, sold, put into slavery, and end up in a prison and stay in prison for 12 years till he's 30. All of that, how would you like that to be your years, your teen and into early adulthood years? Especially when you're young. Yeah, you know, he could have wondered so many times what's going on. But God had a plan, and if he hadn't been in that prison, he wouldn't have found the way that brought him up to the throne, second in charge. But because he was in prison and who he talked to in prison and what God did through him in prison, it escorts him into the throne room in a heartbeat. His picture changed just like that once again. That's our amazing God, and that's our assurance that no matter what's going on in our future, there is always hope. Hope in Him. For those who believe Him and those who follow Him, He has promised us to be with us, to bring us through it. He's promised to do more than we can ask or think. That's Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, that, that He goes beyond what we can ask or we think. And He tells us in Philippians 4, 19, He supplies all our needs. He didn't say some. He didn't say the ones you remember to bring to me or the ones you know you need. He said, I supply all all your needs according to my riches and glory by Yeshua HaMashiach. Well, Yeshua, he's heir of all things. He created it all and it's all his. So I don't know what you could need that's beyond his ability. There isn't. It is. And his plan is infinite and it goes forever. The future is ripe with hope and promise. Yermia, Jeremiah 29 and 11, a time when they were going to go into captivity, God says, but I know the future I planned for you. And it's a good future, a future with a hope. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that it was going to end that way. I love studying Yermia. You ever get discouraged and think you're in prison? Study Yermia. Study the way they treated him. Study the way his life was. Study what God asked him to do. And yet in the midst of all this comes out this verse. I know the future I have. And it's glorious. That's what we are plugging into here. We go on and we'll say that these lights are going to flicker and they're going to die. We know that. But we're going to rededicate ourselves to the lights the way they rededicated the temple. We're not dedicating to something out there. We're dedicating ourselves to the Lord to allow him to work through us in these ways so that we can be refreshed, we can be renewed, we can carry on being directed by the light. Uh, there's a, um, he's a revered rabbi, Dr. Samson Levy by name. He's quoted as saying, may their precious lights guide our way in all days to come. And I, being a believer in Yeshua and those with me, like to say, may the true light of Hanukkah guide our way in all the days to come because he has promised to be our guide. Thy word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. That light, the light of the world, as I've already said, it knows no power failure. I'll tell you, plug into it. 
you'll be electrified, not, <laughs> not electrocuted, but you'll be electrified because when you see that he stooped down to bring the true light into your heart, then he's brought in and he wants to shine out through you, illuminate everything you need to know and understand, illuminate for you in your circumstances, but to also send you out as a light. Just like the Hanukkah were to be in the windows or the, the doorways, the threshold, the light, the darkness outside, we need to be those lights for Yeshua. So we dedicate ourselves to the true light of Hanukkah that we might act in this way. In his light we have life. We use our minds. God never says, check off your brain. Quit using He gave you a good brain. He wants you to use it. <laughs> so that you can come into the truth. And in that truth, know the way home. Know the truth that makes this life beautiful for you now. And to appreciate the beauty of God and to long to see Him. Can you imagine seeing Him? Seeing the light of the world. And why He's called light? I think at the time of the Transfiguration when He was just glorified in, in His appearance. Wow. And through that, we come into that time that we are looking to treat others justly, thanking him that we have been dealt with justice, that we might have that peace that, that's dependent on justice and the truth that sets us free so that we can move in shalom, in peace, and bring that to the world so that the world can know now individually, yes, yes, not yes, Virginia, there's a sound clause. But yes, there is peace that you can have now and forever. So let the true light that you have within you shine out to point the way for others to know how to go home. And dedicate yourself to that true light. And uh, uh, what more can I say? Just uh, let it illuminate you and bask in the light. And in the warmth of the sunshine, you will never be disappointed. Hallelujah. That's Hanukkah. That's the meaning of the days. The background shows us you may have war going on right now. You may feel like you're against the huge army. You may think it's impossible. But the God of the miracle of Hanukkah is still working miracles today. And he's with you. And he will always be with you. And he will bring you home where you will never have a worry, a fear, a hurt, a sickness, a need ever again. Do we ache for that? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Every day. But one day, one day, we'll be there. Where in the Bible is it written like the way you, you gave it to us right now? In all those verses I gave you? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I meant, you know, first day, second day, but it's in all the verses. It's, it's not written that way. The only thing the Bible says about Hanukkah is that Yeshua celebrated it in John 10. That's mm -hmm. all it tells us. Um, it's, it's through those who studied it. Um, I don't know where the days actually came from, but they gave meaning to the days, and then we came along in our completed faith and saw the dual meaning, you know, that they stopped short of. You know, they don't know that the light of the world is Yeshua Jesus, so they're still reaching for the light and hoping to, in their reasoning to come to truth and so forth and so on. So they're dedicating themselves to those things because each of those things is important to them as a Jewish person. They want, like right now especially, they'll say, yes, let the world deal with us justly. Let us deal with the world justly. You know, so they, they chose to give the meanings of the days according to what was important to them. That we just saw it, wow, do you realize what a beautiful picture it is? And then we know that the Lord is the light of the world. We know, I think even when he said, I'm the light of the world, I think he pointed to either the Hanukkah or to the Temple Menorah that was burning brilliantly, one or the other. I think he was, and drawing on it, because we know the same way he tells us he's the um, sacrificed lamb, He's a good shepherd. He gives us pictures. And when we study light in scripture, it is such a picture of the Lord. So the fact that, that we have a miracle of lights, uh, to me, is the Lord show, wanting to show us, here's a modern day way of seeing I am the light of the world. When I so. read uh, the Bible and I come across, behold, I've 
think about you. Behold, <laughs> it wakes you up. <laughs> it does. It makes you not miss it. So it doesn't give us to, like, it doesn't tell us day one of Hanukkah stands for this. But we see it in, in the scriptures. We see it in the light. And we've developed that to, to have that kind of meaning to us. So it's just pulling it together ourselves in, in an object lesson. So, like we sometimes will say about the shepherd and the sheep, you know, we, we draw it from, the, the principles are there in scripture, mm -hmm. but we'll draw it together to see that full picture and to get that full meaning. So, any other questions or comments? Brenda, can you uh, help her unmute Roger? Thank you. She looks funny, trying to, try to speak. It's coming. <laughs> Try to unmute. There you go. Um, there is really not a wrong way to do it. Uh, there was one whole ritual explanation on, you know, I have from our perspective, uh, believe in person on each aspect, but the days that, the day one is there, well, that's the, Somebody, somebody set that up, but it's not scripture necessarily for it to be If I may, six years ago, I started to I love it. I so at that it, I just need to go here and buy it. I think it's pretty much my history. We are not supposed to start it. Understand because of the equipment, mm -hmm. but I, it, it, so I just want to summarize. Brendan made some great points, you know, one of which is there isn't a wrong way, and that you know, she dedicates herself again to what the lights are saying and carrying them out, and how you can share, you know, even little children can understand it, can be a part. And that I, I think I'm hoping I'm saying everything, I'm trying to remember everything that I could catch what you were saying was really great. Um, it, it just is a great object lesson for us. We know Yeshua celebrated it, so we know it's an authentic holiday. 
I think it's no coincidence that it comes so close to the time that he came into this world that we celebrate, whether we're right or wrong on that day, doesn't matter. It matters that the light came into the world. Um, and I even think what popped in my mind is she was saying, I, I tell my little niece probably every year, she was two and a half. And they, her mom and she were leaving where we just had our Hanukkah meeting and we'd held it in a church that had a simple nativity on the roof. Just, you know, you could tell it was a crash, Mary Joseph and the baby, you know, in the manger. That was it. And my, um, my sister-in-law was trying to make sure that Becca was beginning to catch the true meaning of, of what we're celebrating. So she pointed up to it and she said, Becca, do you know who that is? And Becca piped up right away and says, yes, that's Mary and her little lamb. And we chuckle and we laugh because obviously she was mixing things, but out of the mouth of babes comes truth. Yes, it was about Mary and her little lamb, the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. So even in that, you know, when we look at the different meanings and symbols and things that we draw from Scripture, yes, Brenda's right. If this isn't one that's commanded by God, thou shalt, and we have to do it this way and do this and do that. But in our freedom with it, to embrace it and see it and, and see the significance, the picture that it represents to us. It is beautiful, and it is something um, I love to take to the children because they do grasp it and you know run with it and we want them to learn early on he's a light of your path you know if you let him be you know we've i've got another great niece coming along now who's who's just three and it thrills me to see her mommy teaching her you know and, and hearing these little things you know about yeshua jesus you know so um don't sell little ones short you know, the, it's precious to see them come to, to know and understand and, and learn that he, Jesus loves me so that he gave his life that I might have that abundant life with him one day. So, um, I want to talk the song and this little light of mine. Yes, and Loretta started it earlier, this little light of mine. <laughs> Yes, yes. And I think one of the most beautiful times I heard it sung was by Billy Graham, yeah. Cliff Barrows, and um, who was it? George Beverly Shea. Yeah. Billy Graham can't carry tune or couldn't any better than I can. And I don't know what came over him at his crusade, but he looked at his two men and he said, shall we do it? So obviously they'd done it <laughs> privately before. And he just started out, you know, this little light of mine. Right. And those three no, men stood no there no. in the midst of a huge crusade and just like little children singing to their father. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. I love that. And I love that song because of that. You want to pray? Oh, they want me to pray out so those who want to sneak out my door can. Well, because it's four, it gets dark. <laughs> okay, okay. And you don't have the Hanukkah lights to light you. Okay, okay. Then ask her if there's, uh, yeah, if there's a request she wants to share. Okay. okay? All right. Let's go ahead and go to prayer. Lord God, thank you. You are the light of the world. Thank you that you have illuminated us, that we've come to be bathed in that light and that we can walk in that light every moment of every day. Thank you that you are beyond our understanding and that you are ahead of us and that you take even what was meant for evil and work it for good. Lord, thank you that at this time of year we celebrate that you came into this world, that you put on skin, that you came for the reason to simply to die for us, to raise from the dead for us that you might live for us, give us that abundant life, and bring us home with you one day, forgiven of our sin. Oh, Lord, how we thank you, how we praise you, how a gift for us is your presence. And we see it in the lights, and we see it in knowing that you came into this world. We thank you that you are the truth that sets us free. For those of us who have it within, Lord, may we be shining it out. May we be uh, candles lit that cannot be hidden. This little light of mine can't be hidden under a bushel. May we be quick to share it with others, and may they want the light in their lives also. So use us to bring many during this time to know you in that personal way, and we thank you, each one of us who does. 
We give you all glory, and we long to be in the Shekhinah glory of our God to see the light of your face. Ah, hallelujah. One day, one day soon. In Yeshua Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, whether I say blessed Christmas or happy Hanukkah, I cannot believe I'm going to say happy New Year. <laughs> but may you be blessed in all ways if we don't have contact with each other another time. I hope this was a blessing. Some of you have been